Lord. So let's pray, amen, and ask God's blessings uh, on the service this morning, all right? Brother George Diaz, do that for us, please. Amen. Father, we just want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity and the free will that come to you. And yes, Lord. seated. If you're visiting with us this morning, inside the bulletin that you have there is a tearaway visitor's card if you'd fill that out for us. And uh, just uh, we might have a record of your attendance. And if you would, just stick a $20 bill with it. We'd appreciate that. You can stick it in the offering box back there or just hand it to me directly. Amen. Uh, but uh, anyway, I'm glad you're here this morning. All right, let's continue singing, Brother Kevin. Number 398. Glory to his name. 398. services 
I'm so thankful to be a part of a family attending the best church in Wichita Falls. <laughs> Love you all, Barbara Washam, and we certainly Amen. appreciate Miss Washam, and we are glad to hear that uh, Brother Wilbert did well in his cataract surgery, and so he's seen better, and he's home recovering, and uh, so we praise the Lord for that. And I know we got a lot of needs. Be sure to go by the table back there and pick up a prayer list. The prayer list is for our people. Amen. My house should be called a house of prayer, and I want you to be able to have that list in front of you as you pray and uh, be, in, be in prayer for all these. Listen, if, if we don't pray for each other, pray tell me who's going to pray for us. Amen? Uh, you know, we're not, the world's not, they don't care about us. That's right. Uh, we've got to care about each other. Amen? And uh, we do that by prayer. That's part of it. I wanted to give you an update on a few of our missionaries this morning. On the other side of this wall, Stretching right here is what we call our mission wall. And, uh, you know, if you want to venture down that hall and take a look at those letters, we have new letters coming in all the time uh, from our missionaries. We support missionaries all over the, all over the world. Uh, we've got a new letter in this week from Ernie Brown in Ecuador, from Arza Brown in Hawaii, from Brian Johnson in Lithuania, Heath Fusner in Ethiopia, Stephen Barnes in Guam, David Smith in Quebec, and many others. And uh, they're back there on the wall for you to look at and to read updates. We, we just had our Faith Promise Missions uh, Month in March. And I wanna, I'm happy to report to you that missions giving is up. Amen. Amen. I said missions giving is up. Amen. Amen. And uh, up to the tune of about $700 a month. That's great. Amen. So as we, as we see that money coming in, of course, we want to make sure that our missionaries are taken care of. And we appreciate uh, the, the work that Miss Becky uh, does on that particular uh, end of the, of the finances. We appreciate that. Uh, a couple of things to note. I wanted you to note this. That Brother Stewart, Bruce Stewart, has changed his field from Gabon uh, to Liberia. And uh, they, the doors have closed in Gabon. And so he's, uh, they, they have an open door to Liberia. And they'll be working with the deaf there in Liberia. So... Uh, be sure to pray for them as they leave this coming January going to the field of Liberia, to the deaf. Also, Brother Brown in Hawaii writes to tell us that, that there in Hawaii, by the way, if you're still feeling bad about the pandemic, listen to this. Uh, he writes and says that uh, in Hawaii, the mask mandate comes with a $150 fine if you're caught without a mask inside or outside. All right, so... That's something you might want to pray for them, bless their hearts. And then, of course, Brother Gorman, uh, you know, Brother Gorman family, John Gorman, has been up at Fort Dix, New Jersey. They are now headed to establish a brand new church plant uh, in Colorado Springs, Colorado, uh, outside Fort Carson uh, there. And so we're excited. They are now heading that direction. Uh, so pray as they get settled in in that new place in their new ministry. I know they'd appreciate that. We've got some great missionaries. Amen. We really do. And I'm excited about that every time I hear and see these letters that are coming in. Now, also a couple of other uh, things to note. Let me see if I get my phone out here. I got, uh, uh, sometimes I just go to my messages here and there's my wife's name. All right. She said, don't forget to announce <laughs> that we really need help with cleaning the church. Amen. All right. Especially... Uh, if we are going to open Wednesday nights, by the way, that is the plan coming up here uh, during the month of June. We hope to get back to Wednesday nights. Now, I didn't hear one of you, but that worries me now. We, were, <laughs> we, we, we like to get back to doing that again, and, and one of the reasons is, is uh, of course, the in-person service is so much better. We get a chance to do, as Brother Elfring mentioned again this morning, and, and that is to pray corporately. Uh, to be able to come together and have corporate prayer, which is just awesome. And then, of course, our, our teaching. Now, we'll still uh, video it. But anyway, we'll give you a date on that when that starts up and get back to my place here. Uh, it's great. It's a great opportunity to serve your church. That is the cleaning. It's only once every five to six weeks, and you don't even have to clean the bathrooms. <laughs> so also, we're going to need more nursery workers in order to open Wednesday nights up. So you, if you can do any of this, please see Miss Starlin. Uh, if you would like to help in these areas. And so please, please do that, okay? Now, I want to say a big word, a big word of thanks to all of you that are contributing, donating things 
uh, to the garage sale. It's, man, it's filling up. We've got a lot of stuff in there. Excited about that. Now, that's next Saturday. Am I right? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, next Saturday. Yes. So this will help uh, put together fun stuff for our young people to do, uh, go to conferences and do things like that, fun things during the summer. So uh, you want to come out and look around. There's some, there's some pretty neat stuff out there. Yes, sir. Uh, and, uh, man, I just got to tell you this now. <laughs> Somebody might come and make a good bid on this, but boy, Brother brother Gallion had some preacher come by and see me, so I went by and saw Brother Gallion yesterday, and we had a great time together. And, and by the way, pray for Annette. My goodness, she's there at Senior Care. Pray for her. And Brother brother uh, Lee is at home, and, and it's just a difficult situation, right? Amen. And he misses her, and, and it's tough. But anyway, went over, we had prayer together, and cried together, and talked together, and then... Uh, before I left, he gave me a super nice crossbow. 60 pound crossbow with a case and the, and, the, and the arrowheads and all that. So, I mean, it's really super nice. So, I expect somebody to give us a super nice offering on that one. Amen. Amen. And, uh, but uh, that'd be a blessing. And some other things you might be interested in. Now, so where was I going? The garage sale. Next. <laughs> Next week, so it starts at 8 o'clock in the Family Life Center. We invite you folks online if you'd like to come out and see what you can't live without. Uh, one man's uh, uh, junk is another man's treasure. That's right. That's right. I love garage sales. Amen. <laughs> I'm wasting time. But anyway, garage sale next Sunday. So don't forget about that. Appreciate all of you that are doing that. Okay. Now, what else am I missing? Any other announcements? Seem like I'm missing something. Where's Miss Starla? Aren't you glad Miss Starla's here this morning? Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Man, I am so happy she's here this morning. She has really been in the battle of her life the past few weeks, well, months, really. The devil has done everything in his power uh, to, to discourage her. To just, just uh, You just continue to lift her up in prayer, would you? Amen. Amen. Fellas, do you know how important it is to have your wife well? Amen. 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 I mean, it is just important. It really is. And... Uh, so uh, a, a man gets sick, the woman, she's cool, calm, collected, she'll take care of you. Yeah, here's an aspirin, go to bed, it'll be all right. But when mama gets sick, it affects everything. All right. Come on now. Hey, this is yeah. sermon number one. We'll get to the next one in a minute. But it's so true. I appreciate hey, this story. I love her so much, and she's uh, such a good wife to me, and I love her, and I just want her to be well. So pray for her. Amen. I'm glad she's here this morning. All right, then, Brother John and uh, Brother Caleb are going to come and sing for us before the message this morning, and uh, we appreciate that, and then we'll get to the message.
asking the church to do him a favor in verse 30 when he said that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. And then in Ephesians 6, after he talked about the armor uh, of, the, of the Christian soldier, writes in verse 19, he says, and for me, verse 18, praying always, and then verse 19, and for me. This morning I want to talk to you about how to pray for your preacher. Father, I ask now that you might help me as I preach, that you might give me liberty and anointing of the Holy Spirit, that you would empower, empower me, Lord, to say exactly what ought to be said, to leave undone that which ought not be said. I pray today, God, that what I say would be both practical and palatable, that God's people might be able to receive it and to receive it with joy. And then, Lord, that we might apply it to our hearts and wisdom now, God, I pray today for my own abilities, for I know I'm not an able person. Uh, I know, God, that you said, uh, Paul said that uh, it was God that made him able. And uh, so I ask, Lord, that you might divinely enable me today and that you might help me under the anointing of the Holy Spirit to say exactly what ought to be said. Lord, this is not a message I desire to preach uh, personally, but, Lord, I know it's needed. And so I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You might be seated this morning. And uh, today is a special day for me and Miss Starla. And uh, I'm trying to find my place here. I'm not, I'm not texting anybody, okay? Uh, but uh, I make notes every so often. I say to myself, man, I've got to say that. And then I forget to write it down, so I'm still on my phone. Here we uh, go. Today, uh, today Miss Starla and I are celebrating our 11th year as uh, the pastor and pastor's wife here at Southwest Baptist Church. Amen. Eleven years ago uh, this week, we moved to a place that I never thought that I would move to in my entire life. And um, I told the Lord while we were in Arkansas, Lord, get us back into Texas. I just didn't know how to, I didn't specify, did I? Um, so, um, but here he, he moved us to this place, and uh, 11 years ago, I preached my first message, and uh, many of you, uh, many of you, probably most of you in this room were there uh, when that took place. And uh, I thank God every day for what God has done over these past 11 years. It's been a real blessing and privilege to, to be your pastor. And I know some are stretching their neck out thinking, is he setting us up to, uh, to resign? No, no, I'm not going to do that, not yet. Uh, I have no reason to do that. Amen. Uh, Paul said in the scriptures that he magnified his office. Amen? The office of apostle. Paul didn't magnify his person. Paul magnified his position. Paul didn't magnify his character. Uh, Paul magnified his calling. His calling was to be a man of God. No preacher in his right mind would ever use his office to manipulate his opportunities. That's what a hireling does. A hireling will do that. He doesn't, he doesn't care about the flock. So a hireling will do that, but not a real man of God. Now you can look across the landscape this morning. If you do any serious looking, you'll, you'll be able to see quickly that there are a lot of hirelings behind pulpits this morning. A real man of God appreciates the opportunities and the responsibilities that the Lord gives him. And he makes sure that he is a wise steward with every one of those. Because the Bible tells us clearly in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7 that someday there will be one person over these past 11 years that will have to stand before God uh, to give an account for the direction and the, and the standards and the preaching of this church during this, during this time. And that person will be me. Okay? And so I have to give an account to God and I want to do it with joy. Amen? I want to do it with joy. I want to be able to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, yeah, we have some tough times up and down. We have some crosswords from time to time, just like any family does. Amen. Right. We love each other and we hate each other. Uh, but family, family fights sometimes. Family things happen. We're still family. And God has seen us through some things. And, and, and I've loved every minute of it. I say I loved every minute of it. That might be a stretch. But I appreciate what God has done in our church. And I know many of you agree with me on this. Amen. I ain't got to the preaching yet. I'm trying to get through this because I really wanted to, to say this. I've heard it said that a real pastor doesn't use his people to build his ministry. A real pastor uh, uses his ministry to build his people. 
I want to be a, I want to be a pastor, and, and I'm still learning how to be a pastor. I used to think I knew how to be a pastor. The older I get, uh, the more I realize I don't know how to be a pastor. And so I just have to get up and be what God has put me here to be and do, and, he, and have him sanctify my personality and sanctify my abilities and sanctify my person so that I might just get up and under, a, under the umbrella of sanctification do what he's called me to do. But I don't, I don't lift myself up. I lift up the Lord Jesus. I'm, I'm not the shepherd. I'm just an under-shepherd. I also heard an old preacher once explain that the ministry wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for people. <laughs> the truth is that the ministry is people. It just is. And people are fickle, but thank God he's always faithful. The preacher is here to minister to the people, and the people are here to minister to the preacher. We work together. Amen. It was a Sunday night in the number in summer of 1976 that a 17-year-old boy got up in the pulpit on a Sunday night and preached the only verse that he that he knew. He'd only been saved a few weeks or, or, or about a month, and then he'd surrendered to preach. And, and, and two weeks after he surrendered to preach, the preacher said, now you get up on a Sunday night and preach what you know so far. And about all I knew was John 3, 16, and I preached that. But that's been now almost 45 years ago. I know I don't even look 45. <laughs> Since then, I've learned that there are two things that every minister must do and every church must have. Are you listening? Yeah. They are like the two wings of an airplane. You can't do one without the other. They both, they, they both must be there in order for that, that plane to fly and in the air, and it must be uh, this thing of prayer and preaching. In Acts chapter 6, before uh, they elected the first deacons, uh, the apostles made it known to, to the people that they, they needed to give their attention, give their focus to the ministry of the word and prayer. Those two things are, there must be. And in the house of God, there must be two main stays in the church. That's preaching and prayer. Amen. All right? Amen. And this world don't like either one of them. And the devil sure don't like either one of them. Right. Right. But if we're going to get rid of something, let's don't get rid of the preaching. Right. And let's don't get rid of the pulpit. Let's don't move the pulpit off to the side of the stage and put a drum set in its place. Amen. Let's don't do that. Right. Let's let it be in the middle of the stage because this is what it's all about. The preaching of the word and prayer. And the devil doesn't like either one of them, and the devil suffers from both of them. And so we need the preaching and the prayer, and the preacher must be one who is, who is attentive to those two things in the church. So I want you to, I want to, and, and Brother Elfrank did a wonderful job this morning in Sunday school, and I keep bragging on him, and I appreciate that, Brother. It's such a good message on prayer. But I want to hone in this morning for a little bit about this thing of prayer, but hone in on a particular area of prayer in your life that is absolutely necessary for you and me, and that is intercessory prayer for your pastor. Intercessory prayer. Paul said, look, if you're going to strive about something, if you've got to fight about something, let it be that you fight together with me in your prayers to God for me. If you're going to put your energy into something, you're going to put, devote yourself to something in, in this Christian life, let it be this. If you've got to do something uh, with all that uh, energy and that time together, let it be that you do it together, that you pray. Pray for me. I need your prayers. I need your prayers. The fact is that every preacher needs our prayers. I don't like a message like this personally because I'm the preacher and so I feel like I'm preaching about myself. But, but it wouldn't matter who's standing behind this pulpit. Someday I'll not stand behind this pulpit. Someday I'll be gone. And some other man would stand behind this pulpit. And I would expect that your mind might go back to the day when you heard the preacher say something about praying for the preacher and that you might recall some of that and begin to pray for that man of God that he might do what God put him there to do. My job is not to be your pal. Right. My job is to be your pastor. Amen. And my job is to teach as well as preach. 
Because in Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about the gifts, that are special gifts that are given to the church. And you have the apostles and your prophets. Then you have the evangelists. And then you have the pastor and teachers. And really that is a combo word, if you would, for that same person. The preacher who gets up and preaches must also be, also be apt to teach. You see, apt to teach. So he is the preacher and he's the master teacher. And it's his job to make sure that the, the doctrine of the church and that the whole counsel of God is being preached and taught in the church. Amen. Are you still with me? Right. And that's what his job is to do. Now, that your preacher needs your prayers. Every preacher needs you, look. The preacher needs your prayers more than he needs your gifts. Amen. He needs your prayers more than he needs your sympathy. He needs your prayers more than he needs your respect. Did you know it's possible to not have respect for a person and still pray for them? Your preacher needs more, needs, needs your prayers more than anything else. Amen. You'll see a missionary come through every so often, and when he comes to the pulpit, you almost invariably hear almost every one of them say this. They say, take the prayer card. Please take the prayer card, because if you can't support me financially, would you support me in prayer? Amen. Now, I wonder this morning, putting this on a practical level, Right here in the beginning of this message, I wonder really how many this morning, don't raise your hand, but I wonder this morning how many of you actually prayed for this preacher this morning. Now again, we're not talking about the person. We're talking about the occupation, the office, the calling. Somebody needs to stand in that pulpit and preach. I talked to a man uh, recently who was, who was looking for a church. And uh, this particular person had visited our church. And he went away and he said he was impressed with our church and all. I said, man, that's great. And I hope to see you back. He said, well, he said, I, maybe. But he said, I'm still looking for something. I'm not quite sure what it is. But I'm still looking for something. You know, when you go church shopping, and I'm talking to, I'm not being mean or trying to point anybody out, but you know, sometimes people I do a little church shopping, like they do window shopping, you know. They want to see what you got over here, what you got over there, and what the price is, and da-da-da. And, and people do that. But can I tell you the one thing that you ought to be looking for in this life, in this world, when it comes to a church? Those two things, those things I just mentioned, prayer and preaching. Does the church pray? Do they have an effective prayer life? Are prayers being answered? And can I tell you something? Prayers are being answered in our church. And boy, I thank God give him the glory for all that. But also you've got to look at the preaching. Is the preaching in that church? Amen. Is it biblical preaching? Is it bold preaching? Amen. I mean, you can go almost anywhere in our town and find somebody to get behind a pulpit, but are they preaching? Amen. Amen. Well, preacher, what's the difference between preaching and teaching? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> teaching is factual. Preaching is facial. <laughs> teaching gives you a little information, whereas preaching ought to give you some inspiration. Amen. You see, teaching demands uh, an, an audience, an attention, whereas preaching demands a decision. So I give you something, and once I've given it to you and put it in your lap, I ask you, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? That's why we give an invitation. We might have given an invitation in Sunday school. We'll give an invitation at the end of a service. Why? Because we're preaching now, and this preaching is putting something in your lap and asking you what you're going to do with it. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if I like that or not. I'm not sure if I want that kind of a, a pastor. Well, here's some men you might not want to consider as pastor. Adam, he was a good man, but problems with his wife. Noah pastored 120 years, not one convert, prone to unrealistic building projects. <laughs> Joseph, big thinker, known to be a dreamer, but has a prison record. Moses, modest and meek man, but poor communicator, even stutters at times, sometimes blows his stack and acts irrational. Some people said he left his last church early with a murder charge. <laughs> David, the most promising leader of all until it was discovered he had an affair with his neighbor's wife. Uh-oh. Solomon, great preacher, but the parsonage would never hold all his wives. <laughs> Elijah, prone to depression, collapses under pressure. Hosea, tender, loving pastor, but the congregation might have trouble handling his wife's occupation. Amen. Deborah, strong leader, seems to be anointed, but she's the female. <laughs> Jeremiah, emotionally unstable, alarmist, negative, always lamenting about something. Isaiah, on the fringe, claims to have seen angels in the church. 
Jonah refused God's call to the ministry until he was forced to obey God by being swallowed by a great fish. Amos, too backwards, unpolished, maybe with some seminary training, he might have promise, but has a hang-up about wealthy people. Might fit better in a poor congregation. John says he's a Baptist, but definitely doesn't dress like one. Sleeps outside, has a weird diet, provokes denominational leaders. Peter has a bad temper, has been known to curse in public. Mm. Had a big run-in with Paul, too aggressive, a loose cannon. Paul, powerful CEO type leader, great preacher, however, short on tack, unforgiving with young preachers. Can be very harsh, has been known to preach on that. James and John would make good co-pastors, but each has an ego problem, have been known to threaten a whole town after an insult. Timothy, too young, Methuselah, too old. But there is one candidate that might make the best pastor we know. References are solid. He's a steady worker, conservative, has good connections, knows how to handle money. His name is Judas. <laughs> you know, when you think about preachers, oftentimes you've heard me say, and I get a chuckle out of this every time, but a lot of people look at preachers like a used car salesman, you know. They're not sure what to do with a preacher. And a preacher is a breed of his own. I'm telling you that right now. I know I've been in it a long time, and I'm telling you, it is one of the most unusual occupations. And one of the most blessed ones, but I'm telling you, one of the most unusual. You see some of the most unusual things. Many preachers, I told Brother Caleb the other day, we were talking about this. I said, Brother Caleb, if you're not called to do this, it's going to eat your lunch. If you're not called to do it, it's going to, it's going to eat your lunch. You know, it may eat your lunch anyway. 1,500 pastors leave the ministry each month due to moral failure, spiritual burnout, or contention in their churches. 4,000 new churches begin each year, but over 7,000 churches close. 50% of pastors' marriages will end in divorce. That means the odds for a preacher and his marriage to work out is no better than the world's. 80% of pastors, 84% of their spouses feel unqualified and discouraged in the ministry God's put them in. 50% of pastors, this is half of pastors, so discouraged that they would leave the ministry if they could. They just don't have any other way of making a living. 80%, 80%, 8 out of every 10 seminary and Bible school graduates who enter the ministry will leave the ministry within the first five years. 90% of pastors said their seminary and Bible school training did, did only a fair to poor job preparing them for the ministry. That's true. 85% of pastors said the greatest problem in, uh, is that they're sick and tired of dealing with problem people. Amen. Such as disgruntled elders, deacons, worship leaders, worship teams, board members, and associate pastors. That associate pastor gets me every time. <laughs> Got to marry them into the family to make them do right. 90% said the hardest thing about ministry is dealing with an uncooperative person. 70% of pastors feel grossly underpaid. 90% said the ministry was completely different than what they thought it would be before they entered the ministry. 70% felt God called them to pastoral ministry before their ministry began, but after three years of ministry, only 50% really felt called. <laughs> and he goes worse, goes worse. Pastors' wives, 80% of pastors' spouses feel their spouse is overworked. 80% of pastors' wives feel left out and unappreciated by church members. 80% of pastors' spouses wish their spouses would choose another profession. And on and on it goes. Do you not think that the man of God needs prayer? Amen. It is no secret that the Prince of Preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, had bouts with depression. We all know this. Here's an introduction to one of his sermons from Isaiah 41, verse 14. Quote, I have to speak today, or I have to speak today as my, or to myself, and whilst I shall be endeavoring to encourage those who are distressed and downhearted, I shall be preaching, I trust to myself. For I need something which shall cheer my heart. Why I cannot tell, wherefore I do not know, but I have a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. My soul is cast down within me. I feel as if I had rather die than live. All that God has done by me seems to be forgotten, and my spirit flags and my courage breaks down. I need your prayers. I need your prayers. Last night I sat down and made a list of the 10 men who have had the greatest impact on my life and ministry over these past 45 years of ministry. It was interesting to me that all of them, 
Every one of them except for two were preachers. Two of those eight preachers were Church of God preachers. One was an Assembly of God preacher. Three were evangelists. One was a missionary. And two of those eight preachers pastored me as a young Christian. And all of them are in heaven this morning. One of the great things that all these men and preachers have in common, you listen to me, that why they have such an influence in my life. They were men who loved prayer. They were men who loved preaching. Those two things. They loved it. They wanted to be their best in those two areas. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying here in our text. I need your prayers. I need you to pray with me and I need you to pray for me. Why should you pray for your preacher? Let's look at it. Verse 30 again. He says these words now. I beseech you, brethren, uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Number one, why pray for your preacher? Number one, for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that? I beseech you, brethren. I beg you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Remember that the pastor is an under-shepherd. I answer to God. I must, every time I come to this moment to preach the gospel, I, I must be aware that I am not only preaching to you, but I am preaching, in a sense, to God because I must give an account to him for that message. This message, there are many messages that I know someday I will have to give an account for that I will be ashamed of. I know that. There were times when I preached in the flesh. There are times when I preached something that was more of an opinion than was the word of God. I'll have to answer those for those things before God. God is recording this this morning. And so I must first and foremost be responsible to him. Yeah, the Lord Jesus Christ said, my, if, if I'm the fear, it won't be the fear of what man might do to me. It must be the fear of what God might do to me. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And so when I come to the pulpit, I represent the Lord Jesus Christ. That doesn't make me the Lord Jesus Christ. It just doesn't make me any better than anybody else. But I represent him. That's why... I'll do my best to look presentable and clean and, 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 and try to make sure that I don't offend anyone unnecessarily. Right. Now, if the Holy Spirit gets a hold of your heart and twists it, that's between you and God. Amen. amen. Right. But if the preacher is up there doing his best to preach the Word of God, you amen him, you support him, and you thank God for him, and you ask Jesus to help him. Because he represents the Lord Jesus Christ. I may be the only, and by the way, you may be the only Bible some people ever read. Folks will come to church like this and they'll sit and they'll listen to the preaching and I've heard many of them say, they'll go away and say, I've never heard quite like that. You Baptist or something else and they're right. I don't know of any denomination, any group of people anywhere that does it quite like Baptists. Old fashioned Baptists know what it is to preach. Now, there's a lot of different kinds of preaching. There's loud preaching. There's soft preaching. There's hack preaching. We call hack preaching. Amen. You know, I'll tell you what now, brother. I'll tell you what. You better get right. I'll tell you what. Amen. You've heard me like that. Now, that's all right. I like that North Carolina, Georgia preaching. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But whatever it is that God, how God might use a man, his personality, his, his characteristics, his virtues, his abilities, his skills, whatever it may be, it's nothing unless Jesus is in it. Amen. The pastor is the representative of Jesus. He, he, you know, I'm there uh, to represent the Lord. And even when I'm out of the pulpit, it's my job to represent the Lord, to represent you. I mean, I don't go to Walmart, you know, dressed in, uh, uh, I don't know how people dress crazy. <laughs> They don't even dress. They go to Walmart in their PJs. Now, could you imagine your preacher walking around Walmart in his PJs? Don't imagine that. Biker shorts. I don't even want you to call them stuff. Anyway, fishnet shirts. You remember fishnet shirts? When me and Starla first met, I had a fishnet shirt. That all this, that, that was the hook. Real or in? <laughs> 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 
So I go out in the world and I've got to represent the Lord Jesus Christ as well as you. And I've got to make sure that I do what I do for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to make sure I don't offend Him and I want to make sure that I bring honor to Him. Number two, not only should you pray for your preacher for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, but you should do it for the sake of the Spirit, for the love of the Spirit. I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit. That is a big S, the Holy Spirit. Listen, what good is a church without the Holy Spirit? What good is preaching without the Holy Spirit? What good is a program without the Holy Spirit? It is the Holy Spirit that makes the difference in an old-fashioned Bible-believing church. It's not always the person in the pew, I might add, that kills the spirit. Sometimes it's the person in the pulpit that kills the spirit. So I must go to my prayer closet, Brother Bob, before I come into this building. And I'm already in my prayer closet. And I'm knelt and I'm praying and I have a certain ritual that I go through. I, I look at certain pictures and my mom and my dad and good men of God that I've loved and if, that, that they were on that list I was telling you about earlier and I look at those fellas, and they're all in heaven, and I'll say, I'm going out to preach. And then I'll kneel, kneel and I'll say, okay, now, God, I'm going out. I need your help. I need your help. I need your power. I need your grace. I need your wisdom. I need your strength. I don't feel so good today. Help me to smile. Help me to be uplifting. Help me to be encouraging. And then, Lord, when I get in the pulpit, help me to, help me to be released of myself that I might preach under the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit. Let that happen, God. Now, it may not be pretty. Roger Staubach, how many remember Roger Staubach? Man, he was a comeback kid, I'm telling you. And he could make some of the worst plays turn out good. He'd take something ugly, make something good out of it. Sometimes a, a, a sermon may be ugly, but it can still be productive if the Holy Spirit is in it. It's the Holy Spirit that goes from, from it's not just the words that connect me to you, it's the Holy Spirit that connects me to you. That's why you must come full of the Spirit just like I must come full of the Spirit. There's no difference here. You need to come ready to hear just like I need to come ready to preach. Pray for the love of the Spirit. Jesus said in John 4 that God desires that we worship Him in spirit and in truth. A lot of preachers are appointed, but they're not anointed. I said they're appointed, but they're not anointed. Not anointed of the Lord. I'm not saying this morning that I am. I want more of God every day, and I pray God might use whatever little things I might throw your way. But I, I want you to know that I do it for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ and for the love of the Spirit. And number two, why I pray for the pre number three, why I pray for the preacher for the unity of the church. That you strive together, it says. Strive together. The unity. There are three things that every good pastor watches for and tries to protect in his church. And you've heard me say this often. But three things. And the first one is the church's unity, obviously. Hey, we have new folks coming in, visiting our church, and many of them are thinking about joining, I hope, and, and we've talked about that. And we've had new members come in, the Shoals have come in, and, and uh, the, the Johnsons and, and, and the Wilsons, and, and, uh, and we just thank God for these folks that are coming and joining, and, and, and that's all exciting. But with each new person that comes into the family, it's a new dynamic. Uh, everything was peaches and cream for Josiah until Levi showed up. <laughs> it had a new dynamic in it, right? Right. Watch Chevy when the new one comes, all right? Whenever. Working on that, okay. And, and so, new dynamics. And sometimes it makes it even worse if, say, the family brought in maybe a foster child who was already up in a few years, uh, or, or maybe to adopt somebody, uh, uh, an adopted child, coming in. a whole new dynamic in the family. Some things change. But one thing should never change, and that is that we strive together to be united. Amen. To be united. Don't, don't, let, don't let anybody suspect you in any form or fashion, uh, no appearance of evil, that you be out there trying to split folks up into groups. That's what happened 11 years ago when I came. Amen. I'm sorry, maybe some of you didn't see it, but it was there. It was obvious. You had, man, the very first activity, I can say this now 11 years out, but the very first activity that we had, some of you remember, very first, a big, big spread, I'll tell you the folks how, we went to big spread, 
and, and you had one group over here on this side of the house, and you had another group on this side of the house, and you had another group over here doing something, and I just went from group to group trying to just, you know, make some headway. How y'all doing? Good to meet you. I'm your new pastor. Go to this group. It was like they wouldn't have nothing to do with each other. And it was tough. I'm not complaining, but how much better would it have been if they'd all just come together and said, hey, let's put it aside whatever differences that might divide us and let's go forward in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's do something. Let's be supportive of the pastor. Let's go on. I wasn't the man they was looking for, you see. Anyway, no, whatever. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm really okay. And you know, I see folks like all the time that used to come and we have good habits and we talk and I'm not that doesn't worry me. I'm friends with many of them now. But the fact is that unity, we need to be united. The devil will do everything in power to divide us. And if the devil can divide us, he'll destroy us. In the very beginning of our country, it was Benjamin Franklin that told those, those congressmen, he said, listen, if we do not hang together, we will most surely hang separately. That's the way it is. We should meet together for preaching. We should meet together for prayer. We should meet together for fellowship. But we come together, and this, my friend, is the most important hour of your week. Amen. Let me say that again because I can't say it emphatically enough, but this is the most important hour of your week. What happens here? What is allowed to happen in your heart? What is allowed to happen in your spirit right now? is going to go with you into the rest of this week. Amen. It's an important week. You go away disgruntled now, you'll be disgruntled all week. You go away happy now, you'll be happy all week. You can make that last. You learn something, you grow. Hey, I've been in church for all these years and I've heard just about everything. And sure, that's true. And you, you know exactly. Some of you can sit out there, been under my ministry for so long, you probably tell what I'm about to say. You're like a wife, you know. <laughs> exactly what you're going to say. That's okay. Amen anyway. Amen. Throw in a united front anyway. Laugh at his dumb jokes anyway. Amen. I'm talking about praying for the preacher, for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the love of the Spirit, for the unity of the church. Here's what you should pray for when you pray in verses 31 and 32. You listen, here it is. That I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have in Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints. And number three, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may with you be refreshed. Four things. First of all, uh, you need to pray for the preacher's safety. You see that, verse 31? That I may be delivered from them that do not believe. You see, the word delivered there means rescued. Uh, this may shock you. This may alarm you. But I've had people threaten me. I've had people threaten to hurt me. I remember many years ago, not me personally, but there was a church, I've told the story before, before I came to the church, they had a big fight. And uh, there was a guy in the back that had a crutch, he had broken his foot or something, and he took that crutch and threw it like a spear toward the pulpit. His intent was to hit the preacher. Boy, that, there's a lot of things going on. Isn't it a, I hope you've never been in a setting like that. I hope you never have, but you know there are many people that have been through that kind of thing. Sitting out there wondering if there's really any, any sense at all about going to church and trying to make it work. People are going to be mad and angry at one another. There's going to be division and fighting. Look, there are ways for us to deal with our differences. Right. Right. Number one, prayer. When's the last time you took somebody by the hand and said, you know what, we're not getting along too good. Let's go over here and pray. Hard to hate somebody you're praying for, isn't it? Amen. 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 Hard to hate somebody you're praying for. And it's hard to hate somebody you're praying with. Some of you could save your marriage if you'd start praying with your spouse. I said, some of you could save your marriage. Your marriage is dead and sold up. You don't enjoy each other anymore. Then get on your knees and pray. Ask God to restore the joy. Just a thought. Fact is that you need to pray for the preacher's safety because there's a lot of reasons, a lot of things out there the devil would like to do to take me out. I can't believe that I've lived as long as I have when I look back over the things. I mean, I, was a, I tried to kill myself on a couple of occasions back when I was a kid. I was in some bad accidents as a kid. Somehow God spared me through all of that. I want to live as long God, as God wants me to live, and I want to live to the full every moment God gives me. Don't you? I want to be safe. I say this on Wednesday nights. Stay safe. Stay well. Stay in love with Jesus. 
But the fact is, I want you to say, pray for my safety. Number two, pray for my service. Not only that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, that, and that my service, which I have in Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints. There's nothing more that I desire, no greater thing that I desire more than that I might say something that would be acceptable to you, that you might be able to receive it. To be accepted of the saints just means to be well received, well favored, well taken. Every real pastor wants the community he serves to accept his ministry. Number three, and I must go quickly, not only for his safety and his service, but also for his state of mind. His state of mind, look at verse three, that I may come unto you with joy. <laughs> joy means calmness of mind. It's the opposite of chaos. You know how the devil's going to get any of us? It's going to start in your mind. He's going to throw something into, the, into your mind, into your thinking, your stinking thinking. He's going to throw something in your mind and get you thinking about that and thinking about that and thinking about that until it drives you crazy. That's why the Lord tells us in Philippians 4, there's a whole list of things, true, virtuous things, that we're to think on these things. Why? Because it's stinking thinking. That's how the devil gets us. Pray for the pastor's his state of mind. People say, well, you've lost yours anyway. But pray that I don't dwell on things I can do nothing about. My daddy was an alcoholic. I remember him came on home one day and he had a plaque and he put it on the wall. You know what I'm going to say? You know what it is, right? The prayer? What is it? Do you remember? Because I, I just forgot it. Help me to accept the things I cannot change. Serenity prayer. Somebody quote it for me. Yeah, I'll be, I haven't put you on the spot. But there are a lot of things in my life I can't change, so I need to accept that. Right? right. Accept the things you cannot change. Change the things that, that you can. But the fact is this morning that all of us, uh, and, 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 but this old mind, there are a lot of times the mind runs with us. Well, that guy's mad at me. Something may, well, that person's upset with me, or this or that. And before you know it, the devil is driven you crazy about that. Pray that God don't let that happen to me. It's called oppression. Yeah. Oppression. A, a Christian cannot be possessed, but he can be oppressed. Don't let that happen. Kick that devil out. I said, kick him out of your mind. Stand up in front of the mirror, look at yourself in the face, and say, boy, don't you think like that. Stop that stinking thinking. Put a smile on your face. Get out there and love your wife, love your family, enjoy life. But it's a shame that there's so many people in this world that, that can affect us in such a negative way. By the way, don't hang around those kind of people. Just don't hang around them. But don't let them get to you. Amen. And then also for his strength. That I may come to you, verse 32, but with joy by the will of God and may with you be refreshed. Refreshed means to be re-energized, to be re recuperated. Uh, pastoring is hard on a man's health. It's a strain, it's pressures, it's deadlines, it's finances, it's budgets. It's making sure things are in order, that people are happy and needs are being met. That's why Moses, his father-in-law, you remember that guy named Jethro? Not Bodine, but Jethro, <laughs> Moses' father. He gave him some advice. He said, boy, you're wearing yourself thin. You sit there all day long. People come all day long with all these problems. He said, would you just select you some judges that will judge the thousands and the hundreds and the tens and, 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 and push that off on somebody. Learn to delegate. Well, pray for me that I can learn to delegate. <laughs> Amen. Amen. A lot of pressures. How, okay, when do you pray for your preacher? And then we're going to close it up. Look at verse 30 again. What's the first word? Now. now. <laughs> verse 33, what's the first word? Now. 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 <laughs> you know why I need your prayers? Now. Right now. Don't wait. Pray now. Ask God to help me now. Ask God to help your pastor be the best pastor that he can be. Yeah. Listen, I know there are folks out there they say, you know, I wouldn't go to church anymore because I've, I've been disappointed in preachers. I've been, listen, if you're looking around, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be disappointed. You're going to be disappointed. That's why the Bible says that we're to keep our attention, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, keeping your eyes on Jesus, seeing him who's invisible, keeping my eyes on him. 
I can't do anything about what you're doing, but I can do something about what I'm thinking and what I'm doing. And I need your prayers right now to do that. Every time God brings you, brings me to your mind, pray for me. Before you come to church, pray for me. When I begin to preach, pray for me. As I am preaching, pray for me. Why? That there might be peace. Look at verse 33. Now that God of peace be with you all. Amen. Why, why peace? Because the devil is the author of confusion. I'm done. Many years ago, I just made a copy of it. I have a plaque in my, in my, on my wall near my desk. Somebody handed me this. I'm not sure if they wrote it or not, but I know that the couple who gave it to me was well-intended. They loved me. And it says these words, Who is my pastor's pastor? It dawned on me the other day that my pastor has no pastor, no human under-shepherd to whom he can turn when the days are dark. Like most other church members, I've called my pastor when there was need, and he never failed me. But, uh, but who is his pastor? Who rushes to his side when the load is heavier than he can bear alone? Is there not something within all of us which cries out for human sympathy and understanding? Is my pastor an exception merely because he's my pastor? The Savior turned aside to talk with the Heavenly Father and spent long hours with him who meets his servants in the secret places. But the Lord also needed John and Peter and James and the others. No doubt in later years those very disciples grieved because they slept while he suffered in the garden. I have made a resolution which, by God's help, I shall not break. I am determined that my pastor shall know that I love him. I shall be a shepherd's friend. Doesn't matter who he is, as long as he's God's man. Doesn't matter how, if he's tall, short. Doesn't matter if he's old, young. If he's in that spot, that circle, that God has ordained as a gift to the church, pray for him. Pray for him. Pray for him. Pray for his family. Pray for his wife. Pray for him. Why? I need that more than anything else. Lord knows I appreciate it. Father, I ask God that you might help us to take this message to heart. And Lord, I mean it so dearly. I mean it so sincerely. I need God's people's prayers. I need their, I, I, Lord, I know that there are many in this room this morning who pray for me already, and I appreciate that. I really do. God, help us to pray for each other. There, there are needs in our church, and God, let us not forget.